Tyson, you've been with Paris. You were childhood sweethearts, weren't you? Yeah, 15 and 16. That's so lovely. You met me oh. Where did you meet? We met at a mutual friend's wedding um, a long, long time ago. We've been married 13 years. Wow. Did you know then, the first time you met her, do you think, OK, she's the one for me? Or did it, was no, it I didn't period? know then, no. I just thought she was a little girl. Cos I was, like, at 16, I was six foot six and weighed about 16 stone, had a big beard. I was, like, <laughs> a full-set man. She was, I thought she was a little girl. Yeah. I didn't realise she was only a year younger than me. Of the people you've knocked out over the years, who did you like the most? <laughs> um, <laughs> at that time, I, I didn't like any of them. Of course not. I didn't like any of them, but, you know, people have beaten and stopped them, whatever. I think Derek Chisora is my, uh, my favourite yeah, yeah. uh, fellow boxer. I yeah. uh, really do get on with Derek. Uh, top guy, top athlete, top fighter. Yeah, yeah. He's been he's, such he's a, a big character sport, as well, isn't he? He's a large sure. character, yeah. How do you calm your brain down when you're going into a fight? Do you just... I see you listen to reggae. That's what originally drew me to you. I thought, lovely. But do you... What's your process? I get nervous before, like, this. I was nervous. You have a wine. Yeah. But, like, actually going in to know that you could potentially be knocked out, have brain, yeah. anything. You know, I, I'm already relaxed. I'm, I'm the most relaxed fighter there is. I'm not nervous or tense before a boxing match. Yeah. I'm not, I don't need to do all this... Um, getting myself psyched up for a fight. I'm, I'm having a joke in the changing room. I'm laughing and joking. It's all fun and games to me because I know I've done all the hard work for the last three months okay. in training camp and there's nothing more I could physically or mentally do. I've prepared and done everything correct. So now it's my time to shine, put on a show for the people who are watching and have fun. You, I get yeah. paid to do something I absolutely yeah. love and adore. Didn't you lose a lot of weight recently, didn't I? No? Yeah, that was a couple of years ago. Yeah, 10 yeah. stone weight loss. 10 stone. That's Ten stone. How did you do that? By uh, training a lot and I was uh, eating... Uh, Eating healthily. Well, let's yeah. have a look because this was, we're going to talk about this because Tyson has a book out, which is an amazing story and it's an amazing journey you went on. But let's have a look at the picture because this is Tyson at his biggest. Oh my oh God. Oh my God. Wow. And, wow. And the, that is a glow up. I don't think that, that, that is. Person. So you've gone from how big were your top left there? Top left, I was 28 stone. Wow. And then um, bo oh. bottom uh, right, I was 18 stone. Wow. So so 10 yeah. stone. And how long did that take you to shift? Took me about seven months. That's, well, that's that surprisingly so a very quick. Period, but I can put weight on very quick. I can also take it off quick, but yeah. I didn't put that on overnight. That was like um, two and a half years of not training and not, not eating right, not doing anything. And that was depression as well. And it was depression, yeah, and anxiety and mental health problems. But it was the first time in my life, first two and a half years, where I'd never done any training for long periods of time. Uh, and I was just eating takeaways and drinking a lot. I was drinking a lot of beer and stuff like that. And I was putting a lot of weight on. Um, and, so, and how did you spiral down to that? What, what, what do you think caused that depression? I've always suffered with mental health problems my whole life, but I didn't really know what it was. Uh, even as a kid, I used to have anxiety, and I'd have that feeling of being left alone and being um, just anxious all the time. And I didn't know what it was until I got diagnosed, like, at 29 uh, years old or something. And it's, you know, that's... I think people will be surprised to hear that, because when they look at someone like you, who's obviously very, you know, physically very capable person, but also yeah. massively successful, in your chosen field. To hear you talk about having those issues, that's, that's quite something. It's, and, and I think it surprises people to know that. Yeah, you know, it, for me especially, like, I come from a, a fighting family uh, where everyone's, like, a, a tough guy. Nobody speaks about their feelings and, and especially, like, not to come out with something like, oh, I've got mental health problems. And for me as well, like, all my friends, family and things, they look at me like I'm some sort of superhero. They don't never think of me as a, as a man, as a normal person. So when I come out with all that sort of stuff, everyone was like, what? Mm. This person's got, like, weakness or whatever? Mm. And I didn't see it as a weakness because I thought, I can't suffer in silence anymore. For a long, long, long period of time, I used to bottle it all up and... And it come to a point where it was just an explosion, like shaking a bottle of champagne up and it just exploded. And presumably you weren't comfortable at that stage, anyway, talking to Paris about these things. No, everyone thought I was like an attention seeker or they didn't really understand it because none of my family had any education on mental health problems. So they didn't know what it really was. Yeah. Um, just the usual stigma on mental health. A lot of people are uneducated on the matter. Mm. They don't understand mm. what it is. And, and just also because coming you can't from see a, it. a working class family, there's that feeling almost like it's a weakness, like it's something you should be ashamed of or you should... Yeah, it was like, well, if you've got this, keep it to yourself and don't, don't broadcast don't it. Don't tell the neighbours, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But I, I decided to go against all that good advice <laughs> and I thought, you know what, there's got to be other people out there like me suffering and even if I help one person, I'll, I'll feel better. 
and I ended up coming out about it, wrote a couple of books about it and a yeah. documentary about it. And it, it went to be a big thing and helped yeah, millions it's a of people. Really, uh, the um, documentaries are great and the book's great as well, The, the Furious Method. Uh, and it's an incredible book about what goes through uh, a champion's mind when he's getting ready for a fight, but also the struggles you went through away from the ring as well. And this is a really tremendous read. So uh, I'll let you have wow. it. I'll, I'll disinfect my copy and you can have it in a COVID safe way afterwards. All don't? right, yes, I'd love to read it. But don't you think that with this um, lockdown that we've had, that so many more people are suffering from mental health? I Most mean, definitely. I have a few friends and... It's been terrible just to be locked up by yourself and not go out. I mean, I can't think of anything more upsetting than just being shut in a room and not being able or a little, you know, apartment. And... Yeah, suicide rate is, is high. Yes. It's higher than it's been for a yeah. long time. Depression, what, all that sort of stuff is, is what was your What was your lowest point then? When was the point when you thought, you know, I really have to get help? 2016, I was... Um, I was really, really ill this day, and I've been planning my suicide for quite a long time. So you'd actually been planning to kill yourself? I've been planning it in my head what I was going to do it and whatever. And I, I, I didn't think I'd have the minerals to do it. Um, and this one day, I just thought, this is the day. So I got in this car, I was in a, I, I was in a, a red Ferrari, and I got up to a high speed, and I was going to crash into a motorway bridge. Um, and I was dead set on doing it. I was 100% in my mind I was going to do it, and this was the day it was going to happen. And as I was heading towards that bridge, flying... Um, I got for about, I don't know, I, what felt like was really close. It must have been a, a few hundred yards away. Um, I had this voice speak to me and say, no, don't do this. You're going to destroy your family's life. Your kids are going to grow up with no father. So I immediately pulled over to the side of the road and I could feel my heart beating in my chest. And I was sweating and I was in a right state. And that was the first moment in time that I realised I couldn't do it on my own and I needed medical help. Yeah. Um, um, but why do you think... How did you get to the stage where you thought death was the answer? What, what, what was compelling you, know, you to...? I was waking up every day and I didn't want to live anymore. I lost the passion to live one. So there was nothing to excite you in life and you weren't feeling connected to your family, I guess? Yeah, nothing way. mattered to me. You know, when you're so low, you get to a low point. Nothing really matters. Not family, not kids, not anything. And you're at that moment where you're going to jump off. It's, it's very difficult to, to come back. Yeah. Um, and that low point, it lasted for a long, long time. It was a long period of time, years, actually. But thank heavens you saw... Because, you know, I know somebody committed suicide, and the interesting thing about it, uh, it's obviously a tragic thing, but afterwards, none of us had known that he was suffering with depression. He'd hidden it so well from everyone. Mm. You know, his closest family knew, but yeah. none of us who knew him professionally it's knew usually that. usually the way, isn't it? People mm. don't feel like they can speak, so that's the last option. If you have people around that you are open with, that usually takes away the issue a little bit, doesn't it? For sure. Problem so shared, did... problem halved. How did you get over it? I mean, how did you recover? Well, I, um, I started to see a therapist. And I, at first, I didn't think it was going to be for me. I thought, this guy's going to tell all his mates, everywhere champion in the world has got all these problems, whatever. And... After going there a couple of times, I realised that if I'd have done this ten years ago, yeah. mm. I'd have had a much happier, better life. Because my life's always been like a roller coaster; it's been up and down. I've never had any stable mm. moments. It's just been high or lows. Um, and I realised that if I'd have, like I said, if I went there ten years previous, I'd never have had to experience of that low and the. the about to commit suicide and all that sort of stuff. But thank you, and it's lovely now knowing, you know, hearing you talk about it this way. Obviously, it will help a lot of people. I would have thought, but mm. knowing that you can tell your children that Dad felt that bad, Dad felt that low, and you, and if you feel that low, you can find help as well. I mean, it will be a, such a positive role for them, role model for them to see you. One million percent, you know. If I can come back from where I was, we sort of stated me. I was 28 stone. Yeah. I was heart attack material um, to turn it back round and, and get back to, to being number one in the world again at my sport. Um, it was a miraculous turnaround. I'm no one special. I was drinking 20 pints of beer He's a day. He's no one special. Like He's just the heavyweight champion yeah. of the world. Oh, He's no yeah, one special. That's all. <laughs> but you are special. Yeah, anybody can do that, it. Yeah. Anybody can do it. You know, it's interesting because Russell's done quite a lot in the field because you have a podcast, don't you, about men and, and so, emotions and health in that way. I mean, it's so important. I, so I can't big up enough what you've just shared. I don't think you realise that someone like hyper, hyper masculine like you sharing your story, the type of men it will speak to. It won't be speaking to nice middle-class men sat around in a circle ready to discuss their mental health. It'll be speaking to plumbers and tilers and people that will feel empowered to speak out. That's the first thing I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. What I observed was the resources are getting better for men. And I know there's a lot of things in female mental health, obviously, but the male suicide rate speaks for itself. There's something going wrong with men. And you described it brilliantly. It's this bottling up 
this fizzing, this inability to share. Mm. And that's a lot of these um, things that are being done are for people from a more educated or middle class background. And working class man gets left behind. And the thing that's missing, it's not for everyone, is humour. Humour often unlocks blokes better than it does girls. You've only got to go into the girls' WhatsApp group versus the boys' WhatsApp group to see it in action. Girls' WhatsApp group, there will be jokes and banter in there. It'll be like, I'm having trouble with my boyfriend. You're right, babe. Debbie's got problems. Prosecco ambulance, Debbie's house, boom, everyone over. <laughs> Whereas on the blokes' WhatsApp group, you've got to look for it in between, you know, banter, goat porn, I'm feeling depressed, goat porn. What goat was that? Porn. What was that last <laughs> In between the two dirty videos yeah, yeah. will be Darren <laughs> telling you he's got an issue. <laughs> you've got to listen out that little bit harder because... Yeah. I'm not, I'm not one for, like, oh, men like this, women like this. Comedy's moved on. But what I've observed, the key difference between men and women that I, I can observe is women tend to have other women circling, forming a protective... You know, Carol's looking down, yeah. guard the eggs, form a Their circle around Carol. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the key thing girls are better at, in my family and my female friend, women will talk about a problem when there's no solution. They'll be like, do you know what? There's no solution. Doesn't matter. Get Linda over, light an aromatherapy candle, talk about it. We feel better. Have a glass of Chardonnay. Whereas blokes will be like, can't be solved. Why talk about something that can't be solved? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, whereas the very fact of talking is an, is an amazing thing. You know, blokes will be like, Gary's got problems. I don't want to watch it. Put him in the bushes. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. your deposit to Falaraki you're going to lose, Gary. And we've got to change this up. I need to ask Tyson about something that's just, I've just remembered as well, because we're talking about, obviously, your crew and what's going on. Now, what's the story here? You've asked to be taken off the list uh, of those they're considering and put forward to the public for their votes for Sports Personality of the Year on the BBC. What's the deal there? Yes, you're all right with that one. I have asked to be taken off the list and they've not listened. And I've even sent them a legal letter to be taken off and they're still not listening. So they're trying to take away my rights as a, as a person to not do something that I don't want to do. Well, you don't have to do it. You don't have to go if you do win. I know, but still, my name shouldn't be on there if I don't want it on there. It's a free country. You know, BBC are supposed to be the politically correct station and they're doing something that I do not wish to participate in. And the reason is, is I don't want an award from, from, from someone to say I'm a, a sports personality. I know what I am and who I am and I know what I've achieved in my life. I know what I've come back from. I don't need a glass trophy to tell me I've done it. And, you know, I'm the people's champion. Like, like he said before about the working class people, the builders, the plumbers, the, the bricklayers, all that sort of stuff. I don't need this, this, this glamorous trophy to say who I am and what I've done. Mm. But, you know, maybe it's not about what you need. Maybe it's people want to, the people who vote for it, want to show you what you mean to them. I know, but... The thing is, is, I'm the people's champion. I don't need to be on that list. Mm. And if I don't wish to be on it, surely I shouldn't be forced into doing something I don't want to do. And so I don't, I don't know what the next well, thing Well, I'd is. like to say, because it's tomorrow night, I believe, so I would like to say that if you do take them off, I am available to be put on the list. Yes. For <laughs> the year. Please do that. Tyson, you said that you're partly what you do in the ring or when you become the character of Tyson Fury, anyway, that is sort of acting, isn't it? Yeah, you know, um, yeah. I put on a show. It's my... Uh, I feel it's my job to put on a show for the... For the people, they don't just come to watch two men punch each other in the face. Yeah. They come to watch the circus, the the show that comes with it, the Viva Las Vegas scene. Well, I know you're, when you enter the ring, your ring entrances, they are they are pieces of theatre. Yeah, yeah. And I, I plan it all myself, and you know, um, I think about what I'm going to do, and what music I'm going to come out to, and what's not been done before. And I, I try and think of authentic, different things. Yeah. Like my last fight for Wilder, um, I came out to Patsy Klein, crazy, crazy, um, <laughs> carried on a throne. Crazy. It was very fitting. I've been crazy. I'm still crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, was a, it was a good one. Tyson, you've been known for singing at the end of it. When you win a fight, you've sung. Do you work out once what song you're going to sing? Never. Whatever comes to my mind, the first second the fight's over and I grab that mic, that's when I'll go into tune yeah. singing. Uh, we're talking about challenges maybe that are there for you once you finish boxing. Yeah. And already you've been very open about your mental health and I guess that'll be an area that you would continue to work in, I would have thought, and, and help yeah. people. Yeah. Um, but I know on a personal level, you said you want to visit space. That's right. And, and, of course, we're getting to the stage where that can be a possibility. Have you made any advances in that? Have you asked people whether you could go? I have, and uh, we've made some real progress. Um, oh, my God, you're going to space? Well, hopefully, yeah. What are you going to wear? Are you going to do the proper... <laughs> I love that. Your first, your first question is what you're going to wear. <laughs> so, <laughs> in that case, you could launch someone you there. You might as well year. do something different. It's yeah. the first boxer to go. Wear a I'm, uh, I've always wanted to go to, to space. I used to look up at the moon when I was a kid and think, you know what, I want to go there one day. 
And this year, on opportunities arose where Virgin are doing um, galactic space travel. Yeah. Um, and it just so happened that the guy he was helping with with that book, he, he was into all, like, space things and all that sort of stuff, astronomy and all that. And he said, you know what? I, I was telling him about how I wanted to go there. He contacted Virgin. And we got through to the head of Virgin. He said, oh, Tyson Fury wants to go to space, yada, yada, yada. Who's the best person to contact? And we didn't think we'd get a reply, like, straight away. And then we actually got an email back and it went from there. And they're supposed to be going into space um, next year, middle of next year. No and I'm going to be one of the first ones on wow. the list. Whoa. And, uh, yeah, hopefully I'll be going to space. Wow. That's a good Are you not scared? You're not worried about... No, because if anything did go wrong, God forbid it did, it'd be like, what a story, what a legendary end. <laughs>